Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. Equity futures just about positive this Thursday morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue, waiting on Wyoming. Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole next week. The Fed's job is not done yet. There's a tug of war that's going on from a macro standpoint. Financial conditions have uh, eased way too much. We got one decent inflation report. One month does not make a trend. Congratulations. We had record high inflation. We just didn't add to it. Even if they thought inflation was coming down, why quit now? With eight and a half percent inflation, the playbook is very, very different. There's still a lot of work for the Fed to do. Jay Powell will signal that very clearly at Jackson Hole. Fed Chair Powell, he has to acknowledge that the economy is slowing. The roadmap is let's tighten a lot. It's too premature for him to do anything different. Let's have that conversation right now with Pictay's Ella Hodger and JP Morgan's Jack Manley. Ella, first to you. We've had a big move off the lows on the S&P, 17% plus at one point. We've had a big move on high yield, spreads much, much tighter. Does Chairman Powell give those moves his blessing in the next week? Good morning, John. Uh, well, what we've done over the last two months in markets is uh, ease financial conditions to the tune where we've given the Fed a bit of a carte blanche uh, to launch more uh, more policy tightening. And I think that's what the markets are sniffing right now. And hence, the last uh, couple of days, we've seen the type of price action that we've witnessed. So correcting uh, on the margin some of those uh, big moves that we saw over the course of the summer. So absolutely, Jackson Hole might be uh, such a platform to announce the Fed's intentions with regard to, with regards to policy, but, but more specifically inflation. Jack, will it make a difference? We've had some pushback over the last month, and this equity market has kept on rallying. I think it probably would on the margin, John, but at this point, so much bad news has already been priced into the equity market. We're getting more clarity on what GDP looked like. We got that uh, uh, encouraging uh, report uh, from retail sales this morning. Uh, I think a, a, outside of the Fed announcing that it's going to hike by 100 basis points come September, uh, I think it is possible that this market continues to move higher, albeit slowly. I, I think it's going to be a grind. What the market's smelling is a pause. Do you sense the same thing, Geller? Just going through the Fed minutes from yesterday, when they talk about the risk of doing too much, when they themselves admit that at some point they'll pause and that much is obvious, do you smell the same thing? Do you sense the same thing, that a pause is coming up? Well, what might support them is uh, data, without a doubt, has been somewhat softer over the last quarter. And uh, also, we've seen the first drop in, in the inflation numbers. And when you look at projections for the next um, 9 to 12 months, uh, inflation seems to be, you know, due to base effects, seems to be set to, to, to print lower. Now, that could buy them some room to maneuver. But uh, really, what we're watching are wages and unit labor costs, which are pretty elevated. And, you know, if you're the Fed, you're looking at those numbers, you're not going to feel uh, comfortable. Unemployment is still pretty, pretty low. So, um, you know, the room for the Fed to keep going is, is pretty much there. And, and as you were asking earlier, this easing in financial conditions, this rally in risky assets probably buys them uh, some cover. Undermining their effort in some ways as well. Ella, two points, two questions. One, how far do you think they take rates? Where does Fed funds peak? And two, how long do you anticipate it will stay there? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we think there might be two stages to this, right? So the first stage, markets are giving you 3.5%. That would be already quite a bit of tightening. And infl if inflation indeed comes lower in the months ahead, they might give them some room to take it easier. So let's say 3.5 seems roughly about fair. But down the road, with the type of uh, pressures that we have, which are structural in nature and, and global, by the way, uh, there is every possibility that you can take rates to 4.5% uh, 4 in the next two years. So. Uh, quite a bit more than what we have priced in the markets now. Ella, including the amount of QT that's set to come from them as well over the next 12 months, you think they can get through 4%? Short term, tricky. <laughs> we will have to see. You know, this is a probability game. We have to watch the data. The Fed's watching the data. They told us as much. Um, so we will need more information in the months that come. Um, but you know, we think they are set to follow policy rates higher, um, given the inflationary backdrop that we have. Now they might get some. Uh, 
leeway, as I was saying earlier, with inflation and, and growth probably softening from here. I mean, certainly that's what the bond market is telling you, that we are very likely to get a recession, recession next year. Uh, but, you know, we will have to see the data uh, in order to conclude whether we can get higher. Down the road, we believe, yes, it's, it's, it's very much possible. Jack, that's the big disconnect through next year. It's 2023. The market is looking for a pause that turns straight into rate cuts. The Federal Reserve is talking about a pause that could go on for months, maybe even a year. Alan Ruskin of Deutsche Bank did some work on this several months ago. I spoke to your colleague, Kelsey Barrow, of JP Morgan Asset Management earlier this morning and talked about the prospect of once the Fed has done hiking, they could stay there for 12 months. Ruskin pointed out the last three cycles. The time spent at peak, seven months in 2000, 12 months in 06, 07, six months in 2018, 19. Jack, is it too early to really model out how long they're going to stay at peak Fed funds rates? I think it's probably a little bit too early to, to make that call right now. But what I would say is that in the aftermath, particularly of the financial crisis, the Fed has realized that by keeping rates essentially at zero for a very long time, it has caused pretty significant dislocations in asset, uh, in asset markets. I mean, you look at what's going on with home prices here in the United States. You look at what happened with equity prices going into the beginning of this year. I think it's going to take a lot to get the Fed to cut things back down to zero. Now, do we move a little bit off of the high, especially if that high is above neutral? Sure, I think it's possible. But outside of a, a pretty significant recession, a prolonged recession, I think the Fed's going to stick to its guns here and keep rates elevated, uh, at least relative to what we've, we've, we've gotten used to seeing over the last 10, 15 years. Equity futures right now, positive a tenth of 1%, about 24 minutes away from the opening bell. Yields are higher in the Treasury market by... Two basis points lower, rather, to 287. They were higher yesterday for a moment and faded after the Fed minutes. You can make the Fed minutes tell you whatever you want the Fed minutes to tell you because there is so much in there. This is the quote that a lot of people pulled out. Many participants remarked that, in view of the constantly changing nature of the economic environment and the existence of long and variable lags in monetary policy's effect on the economy, there was also a risk that the committee could tighten the stance of policy by more than necessary to restore price stability. Mike McKee, this drives you nuts, it drives me nuts, but that's the quote a lot of people are looking at. Yeah, it doesn't really drive me nuts, and, and here's the reason why. Uh, let's take a look at when they made these comments. That was July 27th, uh, and roughly where the red line is there. That is the end of the data that they had. And you can see in the, in the two different sets of lines where they were and where they thought they were going to be. It's particularly true of employment, the white lines. They thought employment was slowing down a lot, and that could mean a danger to the economy in the future. And then look what we got for the July payrolls. And we also saw the CPI numbers for July come in lower than anticipated. So what the Fed was seeing three weeks ago isn't telling you what they're seeing now and what they think they're going to do. For that, we have to rely on the data, of course, and what they're telling us. We've got three Fed speakers today, and they're going to be basically sticking to their positions. Well, maybe. Uh, Esther George, who is known as the hawk, is suggesting that maybe they need to slow down a little bit because they could hurt the economy. Neil Kashkari has always been a dove, and now he's the uh, highest dot in the dot plot in terms of raising rates. Mary Daly, somewhere in the middle, they haven't decided yet. They're going to watch the data between now and then, which leads us to, of course, Jay Powell and the great event next Friday, a week from Friday, that everybody's waiting for. What's he going to say to push back against the markets? Well, Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed chairman, had a uh, president had a uh, very interesting column today on the Bloomberg pointing out that the chair's speech last year didn't uh, illuminate a lot for the markets because he said inflation was going to remain temporary, unemployment was understating labor market slack, and there was little evidence of inflation from wage gains. <laughs> so we're going to leave Jackson Hole knowing what? <laughs> so that was <laughs> August, Mike, that was and then we had a massive pivot several months later. What happened? Uh, well, it wasn't so much of a uh, massive pivot. It was, well, it's inflation, basically got them to change their views. When inflation came out, uh, they immediately went into uh, tightening mode, but it took a little longer than people anticipated. Uh, they were sticking to that first line about uh, inflation, and it didn't work out. Mike, have we got that speech confirmed next week? That Jay Powell is speaking? Yeah. Chairman well, Powell, is it confirmed? The, the Fed hasn't officially said whether he will or not, but by tradition, the Fed chair usually opens the uh, 
committee, it opens the conference with a keynote speech. So we're anticipating and boy, would a lot of people be disappointed if he didn't Oh, big go. time. We're all working on the assumption we get one. Mike, thank you. Looking forward to your coverage. Always awesome. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Really great note in the last 24 hours. And right at the very end, he wrote this. We are surprised that April's five basis points inversion seems to have gained more attention than the almost 50 basis points inversion just earlier this month, which was about a week ago. Ella, I want to come to you on that. Why is this barely a feature in conversations right now? The fact we've got twos, tens trading in and around negative 40 and last week negative mm. 50 something. What's the story there? Well, it's clearly the bond market thinking that we're going to get a recession, uh, the scenario I was alluding to earlier, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, when we get this type of policy tightening, uh, as you were referring to earlier, uh, you know, you're having both QT and unprecedented paces, pace of hikes by the Fed, uh, then clearly uh, the result, uh, the bond market saying, is going to be a significant slowdown in the economy, which is what's required really to, to, to get inflation under control over the medium term. So that makes sense to us and, and it's something that we've been uh, playing for for some time now now how far can you push it uh, is it a big deal absolutely uh, you know of all the economists out there this curve inversion probably has the best track record so one should watch it for certain um, and in terms of how far um, you know we've been here in 08 um, you know in terms of levels uh, and also the 80s right the 80s where we had the period of very hawkish policy by the Fed those are probably the two uh, potential periods you want to you want to watch and also 2000 by the way when we had the tech bubble so for the curve, those periods are important, we believe. Jack Manley, final word here. Well, I'd say when we're looking at the curve inversion in particular, I mean, some of this could have to do with this idea that at some point down the line, the Fed will move back into neutral territory. But, you know, at this point, John, as, as we said earlier, uh, I think that so much of the bad news has already been priced in. We have likely seen the bottom on the equity market and come uh, unless we get some sort of big surprise out of Jackson Hole next week. I think this recovery continues uh, and I think that uh, we can be a little bit more optimistic about the state of the equity market moving forward. Jack Manley, we're going to build on that story in the equity market in just a moment. Stick with us alongside Ella Hodger there. I mentioned twos, tens around negative 40 basis points just to give you the precise number, negative about 36 right now. Mike McKee went through what to expect next week and what we've heard from the former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley, writing for Bloomberg Opinion today. The title of that, Powell will face a tough audience at Jackson Hole. The chair of the Federal Reserve may have a hard time convincing markets that the central bank is serious about defeating inflation. The latest from Bill Dudley, available on the terminal and on Bloomberg.com. Joining us now to look at the stocks on the move ahead of the opening bell about 18 minutes away, here's Abby. John, well, it's interesting because we, of course, have U.S. futures up ever so slightly, but beneath the surface, we've got a real tug of war going on, starting out with Kohl's, the department store. They reported a weak quarter, but more importantly, they cut their outlook. They've slashed their margin for 2023. It's now 4.3 percent from 8.1 percent, so basically have halved it. Uh, on high inventory. Bed Bath & Beyond down nearly 20%. This, of course, after Ryan Cohen, managing member of RC Ventures, uh, announced that he is planning to sell his stake. It was revealed five months ago, and after this stock's more than 500% three-week gain, well, that is what is going to happen and weighing on shares today. Cisco up 5.2%. They reported a solid quarter. They gave an upbeat outlook, sees orders accelerating. For their fiscal first quarter, they now see growth, revenue growth of 2 to 4%, not super high, but better than what had been expected or flat. And then finally, Netties up 3.9%. They met estimates, and that's enough to send this China tech stock higher, given all of the concerns and the headwinds that China tech shares have faced over the last more than year, John. Abby, thank you. Just one more name for you. Manchester United trade in positive about four tenths of 1%. So many of you have reached out to me about that story. We'll touch base with a team in London in about 30 minutes or so. We'll hear from them on the latest on that story and some of our reporting through the last 12 hours. Coming up, trade talks kicking off between the U.S. and Taiwan. It is Beijing that has stepped up its pressure uh, on Taiwan. We've already seen, as I alluded to a moment ago, an uptick in uh, military intimidation tactics to an unprecedented level and an increase in coercive economic tactics. We'll build on those comments and also why one bank thinks Chinese growth this year has a two-handle. That conversation, I'm next.
it is Beijing that has stepped up its pressure uh, on Taiwan across multiple dom domains. They've undermined the status quo and in turn the underpinnings of peace and stability uh, in uh, the Strait uh, in the Taiwan Strait. An uptick in uh, military intimidation tactics to an unprecedented level and an increase in coercive economic tactics. Uh, we expect these practices, these practices, these tactics will continue in the days and weeks ahead. China facing challenges at home and abroad. The USTR announcing its plan to begin trade talks with Taiwan. China urging the US to, quote, carefully handle economic and trade relations with Taiwan and fully respect China's core interests. This coming as GDP downgrades continue rolling in from Wall Street. A two-handle is the forecast now from Nomura for GDP growth in China. 2.8 percent this year. Bloomberg Team coverage starts right now with Anne-Marie down in D.C. and a current in Hong Kong. AMH, first to you. What can we expect between Taiwan and the U.S. as they explore these talks? Well, we knew these talks were coming, right, Jonathan? They were announced on the heels of the president announcing another set of talks, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And there's a number of senators, really dozens, that were pushing the Biden administration to include Taipei in those talks. They were not. So now they have their own separate bilateral talks. But what you can expect is a lot of symbolism with this and not a lot of substance. And it really comes down to the fact that there's no love in Washington for free trade agreements. And that is really where you would get uh, some massive moves that can really move the needle in trade. But a lot of a little bit more um, muted discussions, agriculture, how things work illegally, et cetera. But still, even though uh, it does look more symbolic than there's actually a lot of substance, it is clearly added some fuel to the rhetoric we've seen going on between Beijing and Washington. What do you make of this quote from the China Semiconductor Industry Association when they say this, we resolutely oppose the U.S.'s restrictive actions targeting certain countries. It contains essentially discriminatory clauses in market competition and creates an unfair playing field. I just want to remind everyone that's coming from China. That's not coming from the United States. MH, a bit of irony there? Yeah, uh, can be. But of course, China is always quick to point out what is going on in terms of irony with the United States. I mean, uh, at the, bo the bottom line is, too, for Taiwan, their biggest trading partner is China. So while they are going to have these talks with the United States, I imagine they're going to be very quickly as well to make sure that the trade continues to flow, even though some products are still under sanctions following the trip of Speaker Pelosi, but that they want to continue that trade with Beijing. And uh, you're gracious and generous with your time. Thanks for staying late for us. I wanted to squeeze this in with you again. These forecasts from Nomura and Goldman on China GDP, it's not just this year, it's next year too. And how bad is this economy going to get? It's not just, by the way, Wall Street who are downgrading things. Premier Li Keqing himself came out this week. John, he made the point that the economy has slowed faster than even the authorities expected. So everyone's been cut off guard by this. Uh, you are mentioning those aggressive downgrades. It does reflect what's happening in the data. Uh, July was meant to be the month of recovery, but this week alone we had very bad numbers of retail sales, industrial output and investment for July. Uh, we're getting continued bad news on the real estate side of things. And then the other side of it is we have with... COVID, we have actually the highest caseload of COVID since in about four months in China. A big outbreak in Hainan, that's kind of a tropical holiday resort. Holiday makers getting caught up in the, in the restrictions there. So when you take it all together, none of it's really stacking up to, uh, for animal spirits being unleashed in China's economy anytime soon. All of the pressure continues to be heading in one direction. And that's certainly putting a lot of pressure on the authorities in, in of course, the big political year that it is. Weakness, the buzzword right now on the economy, that's for sure. And uh, awesome, alongside AMH, two of the best here at Bloomberg. Amory Hordern down at DC, and a carrot in Hong Kong. Ella, let's talk about it. 2.8 percent, the forecast from Nomura, 3 percent from Goldman for this year. Weakness may be bleeding into 2023 as well. You've got weakness in China, recession potentially in Europe. Ella, what does that mean for your view on this bond market, the global bond market, core government bonds? Mm -hmm. Well, we're seeing uh, different themes develop. I mean, in the U.S., uh, inflation has been high and sticky, but you have a, a Fed that's very keen to arrest that. In Europe, uh, a central bank that's much more constrained and, and sort of geographically speaking, we're sitting much closer to the conflict area, but also the energy crisis is very much uh, alive here. Um, and of course, China, which is facing a completely different set of circumstances, a sort of weakening economy, structural issues at play, 
um, and actually they've been struggling to stimulate the economy. So they've, they've been at it for, for a few months now, and we've just failed to see that in the data. So what does it all mean for us? It means that geographically you have different opportunities. So you can own uh, long end bonds in the US. Uh, you could be short in Europe uh, with a preference for the curve to actually steepen. So longer maturities trade higher in yield uh, in Europe uh, because of this lack of credibility. And in China, you can actually own uh, local bonds. You can own duration there with the view that deflationary pressures in the economy are uh, pretty severe right now. So, um, and that's what we're doing. So, Jack, with 30 seconds left on the clock, the same question, but for the equity market, where do I want to be globally and where do I want to avoid? Well, there are some compelling valuation arguments certainly to be made for a number of global equity indices. I mean, we do look at Europe as being just way too cheap and there should be some sort of uh, a mean reversion, if not trend reversion there. But at the end of the day, John, I always come back to the U.S. market, especially since valuations have eased off of those highs that we saw earlier this year. You look at the composition of the U.S. equity market, you see the heavy emphasis on technology and tech adjacent names. These companies are coming under pressure right now because of the threat of rising interest rates, but they are long term secular trends. They're not going away anytime soon, and nobody does it better than the U.S. So when I'm looking at allocations right now, we want a global allocation. We want to take advantage of valuation disconnects around the world. But the U.S. is still where my overweight is uh, right now. Hey, Jack. Awesome to catch up. Jack Manley there alongside Ella Hodger. We've got Mary Daly, the San Francisco Fed, speaking just moments ago to CNN and saying what she said before, that it's too early to declare victory on inflation, favors raising Fed funds to a little above 3% by year end. A little bit more on that a little bit later. Coming up, the morning calls and later, Invesco's Matt Brill seeing a higher probability for a soft landing in the US. He'll join us shortly. This is Bloomberg. We are about four minutes away from the opening bell. Equity futures not doing much, pretty much unchanged. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. Morgan Stanley upgrading First Solar to equal weight, 136 price target, saying the company stands to benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act. Next up, Muffin Nathanson downgrading Verizon to underperform, highlighting the competitive wireless industry and highly promotional landscape. And finally, Wedbush downgrading Bed Bath & Beyond to underperform, expecting the retailer to remain under pressure until it can shore up its balance sheet. Coming up, Invesco's Matt Brill seeing a higher probability for a soft landing in the United States. Matt Brill joins us around the opening bell. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bell this morning. Good morning. Here's the state of play. Not much is happening. TK calling it a snoozer. He's talking about the fall for some reason. We're in the middle of August. I've got no idea what that's about. If you want more of that, it's on Bloomberg Radio. Futures right now, unchanged on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq. TK's going to be so unhappy with that. Unchanged too. That's the opening bell. Get to the bond market. We look like this on Treasuries. Yields coming about three basis points on the 10-year. 286.94. Let's call it 287. Yields lower. Looking at euro dollar, a bit weaker on the euro side of things. Euro dollar 101.55. We're down about a quarter of 1%. And crude getting closer. Closer and closer and closer, back to 90. 89.75, up by about 1.9%. That's the cross-asset price action with the movies this morning. Katie's back with us. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, retail earnings still rolling in, and it was not a good quarter for Kohl's. You had the chain see margins fall, comp sales fell, and the chain also cut its full-year outlook. That's thanks to higher costs shrinking consumer budgets. It's a story we know well by now. You can see Kohl's down 7.5%. Verizon also under pressure after downgrade at Moffat Nathanson. Analysts there see a widening 5G competitive advantage for T-Mobile. Of course, that's bad news for Verizon. Shares lower by about 2% or so. I do have some good news, and that's for Cisco. The company gave an upbeat sales outlook as the chip shortage starts to ease. You can see shares popping by about 6%, and Occidental Petroleum Two also getting a bid. That says crude oil flirts with about $90 a barrel. We got there a little bit earlier. It's making an early winner out of the energy sector, John. Hey, Katie, thank you. I'll take the good news because I've got to go back to the bad news now. <laughs> Coal's down and down hard. The latest to cut its profit outlook with the CEO saying this in a statement. We have adjusted our plans, implementing actions to reduce inventory and lower expenses to account for a softer demand outlook. Abby, it doesn't look great for them, does it? It really does not. And this earnings season for retailers has been a mixed bag. Coal's clearly in 
the negative bag, struggling with the inflationary concerns, seeing less of a, a consumer pull there. So as a result, as you were just talking about and Katie was just talking about, they've slashed pretty much everything and really have concerned margins slashed by basically half. Uh, they have been uh, scheduled for 8.6% in 2022. Uh, for 2023, now looking at 4.3%, really pretty incredible. But comp sales fell by 7.7%, fiscal year sales falling, operating margins. And they are having their earnings call right now. So CEO Michelle Gass is speaking with analysts, and there's some interesting things that they're talking about, in-store pickup of online Sephora uh, orders. But something that really stands out to me, John, is that they are mulling the monetization of a portion of its real estate assets. Does that suggest... Uh, what's going on there and that they're really looking for cash flow. Not surprisingly, this is weighing on other department stores, Macy's and Nordstrom, which both report next week. As for the earnings season that's been, you know, it's sort of interesting, John, because again, it has been a little bit of a mixed bag. Walmart stood out for the clear beat and also an, an improved outlook. Home Depot and Lowe's, the fundamentals, okay. Target, though, that massive miss, they, of course, slashed the inventory. That stock, though, over the last five days, they're all higher, including Target, perhaps the thing that Target uh, investors are looking at they held the outlook that CEO Brian Cornell is talking about a rebound in the second half of this uh, year let's see whether or not it happens Abby thank you on some of the retailers here's one that is not rallying I'm not going to pretend I can keep up with Bed Bath & Beyond day to day because I cannot here we are down about 17 percent the latest news the second largest shareholder Ryan Cohen wants out Taylor Riggs has more hey Taylor John we're going to balance memes versus fundamentals on this program as we always do take a look at some of the meme stocks because yes maybe this FOMO trade is coming back a little bit and I mean you talk about the massive run up the Bed Bath & Beyond had I'm looking at our HCP screen it's 20 30 40 percent higher every single day you'd had a massive run up of like 500 percent in some instances so yes today we are falling change up the board and you mentioned the why behind this at least the news today there is some fundamental news around this. We learned yesterday after the closing bell, RC Ventures, you know that is Ryan Cohen, was looking at selling out outright shares as well as maybe some call options as well. And that came out in a filing just after the closing bell. Remember, this is part of a big turnaround story. So maybe some people wondering if the sale of that is a signal, maybe that he is trying to get out of that. So that's at least what drives the shares lowers a little bit today. Change up the board. Again, it, it's unbelievable. I don't even know how to talk about this. We talk about sort of a disconnect, and I thought the meme trade was done when we were all at home with stimulus checks and had nothing to do but stay at home. And yet again, it is back like January 2021. Huge flood of retail cash just coming up and jumping in. Maybe a humble tease, 4.30 to 5. We're going to dive into this on our triple take I show. look forward to that. No interest in the stock <laughs> right now. Someone's losing a lot of money. Someone's making a lot of money. Taylor Riggs, if you've been to one of those stores recently, they have too much stuff. It's overwhelming. Inventory the issues. are about 20 feet high. Mm -hmm. The selection's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do in there. You can get a great, like, bedspread for a the bed college. Spread. Cool. You know. Should I go back to college? Maybe <laughs> some people might want me to do that. Question? I don't know. I mean, maybe okay. you think that too. <laughs> Taylor, go away. Taylor, we're going to talk Manchester United in a minute. I'm sure you're looking forward oh to that. I'm sure you're looking forward to that. A new bull market or a bear market fake out. The latest debate on Wall Street heating up as we get more data. Kelly Lyons back with us for more. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, John, whatever you want to call it, I think we can all at least agree that this rally has been a surprisingly strong one. When you take a look at how much we have risen off of the bottom in mid-June, we're talking 20% plus on the NASDAQ 100 and the small cap Russell 2000 for the Dow Jones, which I have to mention for Tom Keene, up about 14%. And the S&P up about 16% for from those depths in June as well. Now, for technical analysts, you may see some optimism in the Fibonacci analysis as to whether or not this rally can continue, con considering that the S&P has logged a 50% retracement from that record high in early January to the low on June 16th. About half of that move has been recovered. And according to CFRA, that means the bottom has already been set. And they say it actually has a 100% track record of proving true. Their data shows the S&P has never set a lower low in any of the 13 post-World War II bear markets after recovering 50% of its peak to trough declined. But John, just because the bottom is in doesn't necessarily mean we can run further from here. And strategists on the street don't seem to see that much more room within this equity rally. The average target has come down steadily over the last several months, now just at 43 
76, so only about 100 points from where we trade today. And there are plenty out there like Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, Savita Subramanian over at Bank of America who are saying we go down from here. And their reasons why is policy is going to keep getting tighter. The margin pressure is going to keep piling on. And as a result, the worst of the downward revisions for earnings are yet to come, John. The Dow Jones. I don't think I I'm can't. letting that go. I mean, what are you doing to me this morning? <laughs> Taylor wants me to go back to college. Kaylee's quoting the Dow Jones on this show. Kelly Lines, thank you. We'll catch up later. On the S&P, we're down by a tenth of 1%. It's upsetting. On the Nasdaq, not the move, just what people are doing this morning. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a third of 1%. Strategists remain divided over this equity market. You know that story. This recent rally fueling mounting calls for caution. Take a listen. Don't expect this rally to continue to have the same type of legs that we've seen. The systemic risk is that we've priced in the Goldilocks scenario. The employment report came out. We revalued higher. Uh, uh, inflation has been better than expected, revalued higher. Earnings have been better than feared, revalued higher. The risk is still higher because investors are still defensively positioned. Now at this level, we have a confluence of technical and fundamental resistance. What's vulnerable here are the, are the stocks that have rallied the most. At the same time, I don't think that we're going to go back to the lows that we saw earlier this year. If you're overweight equities, this would be a good place to trim back. Joining us now to discuss is Invesco's Matt Brill. Matt, awesome to have you with us here in New York. Let's start here with the economy. You're on the edge of constructive. Less snag, less inflation. Are you hopeful? Hey, John. Good morning. Yeah, we're, 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 we're a little more optimistic, and we've been in this soft landing camp for, for a while now. And, and to be honest, you know, this summer it was getting a little lonely in that camp, but we're, we're getting some applicants back now. So I think what you've seen in the last few weeks is that you know, earnings have been pretty good. You know, retailers have been mixed, but otherwise earnings have been good. You saw obviously a great un unemployment report. Um, and then the inflation numbers have started to come down a little bit. So less stag, um, a little less inflation. So overall, that leads to us being optimistic here. Matt, the price of that story a few months ago, very cheap. What's the price <laughs> of that story now? Yeah, so that was the thing. It was pretty cheap and, and nobody bought it. That was, that, was, <laughs> that was the craziest thing about it is it was everybody was very bearish at the time. I think we're getting a little bit more mixed now. Um, you know, if you look at high yield valuations, they've come in 170 basis points on, on high yield credit spreads. Um, you've had a 5% rally in investment grade corporate bonds. It, it doesn't feel like it's probably the least loved 5% rally you've ever gotten, probably because it feels a little bit like spitting in the ocean because <laughs> you're down still 10 plus percent on the year. But overall, you know, valuations on a historical basis still look pretty cheap. Um, we're at the 60th percentile on IG spreads over the last five years. We're at the 80th percentile over the last 10 years. And if you look at yields, you're at the 97th and 98th percentile. So overall, we've had a rally, but things are still pretty cheap. Matt, just deconstruct what's happened with credit relative to what's happened with core government bonds. We've got a deeply inverted yield curve and credit spreads <laughs> aggressively tighter. What does that remind you of? Well, it, it's, it's a very complex, kind of a unique time, actually. It doesn't remind me of a lot, to be honest, because... You know, but this is not the way that the market's really supposed to be behaving. Um, you're hearing about a slowdown, yet credit spreads are rallying. I, I think what you're having to start is that the fundamentals are such good shape that that certainly helps. And, and the fact that you were started at a starting point that was so much better, um, it enabled uh, you know, a little bit, just a little bit of, of softness in terms of inflation data. And all of a sudden people are saying, well, you know, the Fed doesn't have to pivot to bail us out. That was the thing. Everybody was thinking the Fed was going to immediately pivot and cut. We don't believe that. We actually think the economy will remain strong. The Fed's going to remain elevated on their rates. But that's a decent environment for credit because it means that the economy is not falling apart. Matt, you're perfectly positioned to talk about this. Within high yield, away from just, say, the index, and when we talk about credit spreads coming down from, say, 570, 580, all the way down to about 410 or something right now. Matt, when you look at the breakdown and just deconstruct it for me, are you seeing it right across high yield? Is it an up in quality trade? Triple C's doing the same thing as, say, double B's? What are you seeing? Yeah, so you've seen, you know, the, the composition of the high yield index clearly has changed for one. It used to be about 40% high yield. Now I think it's closer to 50. So the, the amount of issuance in the, in the overall high yield market has gotten higher quality. But recently, yeah, finally, the triple C's have come back. So they started the year strong, then they faded, um, and now they've been coming back. So we've been seeing a pretty good rally. I think a lot of people wrote off the idea of the upgrades, which was our key theme for 2021. It, the rating agencies were behind. And then all of a sudden, the economy turned in 2022. And so people said, we're just not going to get these upgrades from double B to high year, or to investment grade. 
And now all of a sudden you're looking up and saying, you know, some of these credits uh, are actually going to come back to investment grade. So the, the double Bs, um, the fear of duration has gone away there, and the opportunity for upgrades is now back within double Bs. And that's the credit story. Let's finish on Treasuries just briefly. We often talk about the yield curve, twos versus tens. It's negative about 37 basis points. I think the more important question to ask, which is why we look at something like that, Matt, is why are investors willing to accept a lower yield on a longer maturity? Why are they willing to accept that right now, Matt? And what does that tell you? So it tells me that they don't think that, that this is going to last very long on the front end. So they want to lock in these long rates or the, these high rates for a long period of time. We're seeing with pension plans, we're seeing with insurance companies, they continue to buy further out the curve. It doesn't do them a lot of good to lock in for two to four years at three to four percent. They need to lock in for longer. Um, and so they're saying that longer term, the Fed is going to win. Longer term, these aging demographics and demand for fixed income are here. So I better go ahead and buy now or I might be looking at a two percent tenure in a few years. And does that come with a big cost to GDP? Um, I think it. it it's going to be a slow of, a slowdown of GDP, but if you see rates too high for too long, that'll then, that'll then be, you know, be, be more negatively impacting the G GDP, yes. Matt, we're looking ahead to Chairman Powell next week, and it seems almost juvenile that it's just one man who gets to say, yes, this has my blessing, or no, this does not have my blessing. Does it come down to just that? Well, he's certainly a very powerful man. Uh, and I'd say that, that it, it's not all him. Um, it is clearly a committee. But, yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it's, his, it's his decision, it's his voice, and it's what we're going to be listening to next week. He is going to be, he's going to be driving the markets uh, over the near term for sure. You don't happen to be a Manchester United fan, <laughs> do you? I'm more of a Spurs fan, but, but I, 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 know, I know plenty about them, yes. <laughs> Are you happy with this mess that's playing out? Up so, in the north. So you, 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 need, you need Manchester United to be good. It's kind of like the Yankees. You need to have them be healthy, be good. You, know, you have to have a team to hate for, that, that's out there. Um, you know, the fact that they've lost to you know, Brighton and Hove and, and um, Brentford, I mean, they've got zero points and they're coming up on Liverpool this weekend. You know, the team would be worth a lot if they were actually winning, but it's still probably worth about $6 billion. So this is going to be very interesting to play out. You know, at the end of the day, the, the, the Europeans don't like Americans owning their soccer clubs, so I think that there's going to be a changing of the guard here pretty soon. And it could be some Americans that are taken over from the Americans. Matt, I'll talk about that in a moment. Matt, awesome to catch up. Matt Brill there on the latest. Your latest in this market right now on the S&P about 13 minutes in. We are down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down a little more than a tenth of 1%. Coming up, the owners of Manchester United considering selling a minority stake in its team. I think he is an incredible stock market influencer, uh, but in the long term, there is, uh, you know, the fundamentals do matter, and we can see the Manchester United share price since his denial has started to sort of come back off of its uh, intraday highs. That conversation still ahead. stock market influencer uh, but in the long term there is uh, you know the fundamentals do matter and we can see the Manchester United share price since his denial has started to sort of come back off of its uh, intraday highs uh, I would think of anything the what people are more focused on perhaps is whether Twitter gets done or not more than maybe Manchester United at this point so this is how the story started yesterday Elon Musk joking that he would like to buy Manchester United and Manchester United, well, the whole thing's not a joke because Manchester United are looking for a buyer of a minority stake. This is the latest from the owners. The Glaziers and our reporting said to indicate they're putting a minority stake up for sale. Potential buyers entering the field. Apollo Global Management has already expressed interest. And UK businessman Jim Ratcliffe is another early name in the mix. Bloomberg coverage starts right now with Taylor Riggs and Alex Webb. Taylor, this one moving quickly. Yeah, so let me just sort of break down the headlines. I know that Alex can really get into some of the nitty gritty and some of the context and the size and the scope here. But John, sort of expanding on what you laid out here, of course, Manchester United may be looking at, well, the Glazier family selling what could be a minority stake. It started as a joke with Elon Musk weighing in, as he always does, and then somehow this thing gets a life of its own. You mentioned Apollo Global Management expressing actually interest in this. You made a joke earlier about Americans taking over for some of the American so that actually could be it here. I'm not sure I can top anything uh, after that. If you especially have an Invesco portfolio manager weighing in with some context as well about valuations. Do we get some special coverage on this later on the close? We're only just, doing mean star. Just a little bit. So we're really picky. And there are some football fans of other football clubs <laughs> who think this is a meme stock based on what's happened in the last 24 hours. Taylor, thank you. 
Taylor Riggs. Alex Webb, the stock's up by four tenths of one percent. We can park that, ignore that. I think we can ignore the Elon Musk stuff for now as well. Alex Webb, this story, as you know, starts in about 2005 with a monster leverage buyout. It saddled the club with a lot of debt. Walk me through the journey and how we got to this spot, this place here. Yeah, so at the time that the Glazers bought Man United, they were um, one of the dominant forces in, in English football, and that's really tapered over the 17 years of their ownership, compounded by the financial situation. And fans like to say that they've taken a lot of money out of the club to line their own pockets, and that's only half the truth, really. They've taken about $400 million in cash um, over the course of 17 years. That's a lot of money, but it, uh, per year it equates to about $24 million. Now, that's actually less than they pay some of their top players. The real value for them is in the money that's been taken out to service their debt obligations. That's in the form of repayments and, of course, interest payments. And it totals about $1.1 billion over the 17-year period. That is ultimately the paying down the, the leverage buyout, which happened 17 years ago, uh, and translates into them a $1.5 billion equity stake. Now, of course, that's paper money. It does, that's paper wealth. It doesn't actually... It's not money they can directly spend. Of course, they might be able to get loans against it, but it's just there in theory. In order to realise that, they have to sell at least some of it, and that seems to be what's happening here. Alex, the interest around a minority stake, what is the interest around that? I would have thought that if you had sufficient means, say, Jim Ratcliffe, for interest, you'd be more interested in controlling the whole club. Maybe private equity might be interested in taking a stake, but your thoughts on that, how this is going to play out, Alex? So Jim Ratcliffe has said that he is interested in taking minority stake only if it is a, a, a road or a pathway to ultimately open, owning the whole club. We don't know quite a pop, what Apollo's motivations are here. It's hard to see whether the fans would be interested in a private equity firm coming in, given that, given that ultimately the approach taken by the Glazers has been much one of a private equity firm. Leverage the, the asset up and extract some value that way. Now, uh, if you are going to own the whole club, that gives you, of course, control over everything. But if you are just paying in a little bit of money, they could use that money to improve the stadium, which ultimately then improves the value of the asset and might generate improved returns. Alex, what do you think fans will think of maybe private equity getting involved in a club like Manchester United? I think they will probably be highly sceptical. Jim Ratcliffe's a slightly different kettle of fish. For him, I, I would suspect that it's not really a business decision. He's got plenty of money. He's got successful businesses. Of course, he doesn't want to run it purely as a charity, but he is someone who's from that part of the world and will be more interested in running it as a kind of, almost as a fan. And uh, that was probably better news for Manchester United fans themselves. A football fan's dream is someone who just gives un writes unlimited blank checks to make the team better. It might not be quite that full extent, but it's not going to be as interested, perhaps, as taking outsized profits out of it as a private equity firm would. Alex, really enjoyed your coverage through this morning. Thanks for being with us. Alex Webb there on the latest out of London with some fantastic reporting from the team as well. And a special thanks to Taylor Riggs too. Just about enough time to get you some sector price action. We can do that with Abby this morning. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, it's pretty interesting because right now we're looking at a very small decline for the S&P 500 down by about two tenths of one percent. But there are bigger moves relative to the sector, starting out with what's lagging communication services, Amazon, Twitter, etc., down about three quarters of one percent. Healthcare, consumer discretionary financials, all down as well by uh, one quarter of a percent or more. We have a few sectors flipping higher, though. Moments ago, it had only been energy and utilities. Energy up two percent. What makes it so interesting that energy and utilities were the only only ones up so far on the year that is the case so we're all talking about whether or not it's a bear market a bear market rally or the bottom on the year right now there's only two sectors higher one of them is energy up big time for a second year in a row but the three worst sectors on the year John and this is important to remember tech consumer discretionary communication services all of those mega cap techs the big weights of these indexes until those sectors improve could be a rough run for some of the stock bulls. At a decent rally, though, off the lows, that's yes, for sure, indeed. off the June lows. Abby, thank you. Looking at the broader moves then, the S&P down about a tenth of 1%. We're about 23 minutes into this. On the Nasdaq, we're down about two tenths of 1%, negative 0.15%. Yields come in at the front end, down by six basis points at 322. We came so close to the highs of the year on a two-year yield yesterday at about 337, the intraday highs of the year, 345. We've backed away since then. Your 10-year down four basis points to, let's call it, 286. Up next, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg.
about 26 minutes into the session. It's a quiet Thursday, a summer Thursday, if you want to call it that. Equities lower by just a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're down about two tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Coming up, existing U.S. home sales at the top of the hour. More Fed speak. Kansas City Fed President Esther George speaking at 120 Eastern, followed by Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashgari at 145. Retail earnings continue with Ross Stores reporting after the closing ban. And finally, we round out the week with Fed speak from Richmond's Fed's Tom Barkin on Friday. Then it's on to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and the annual Fed get together at back end of next week from New York. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.